Hello and welcome to The Bookmonger. I'm John J. Miller of National Review. Thanks for listening. This show is a production of National Review and we're recording from the studio WRFH, the campus radio station of Hillsdale College. This episode is sponsored by Quip, the electric toothbrush, and I'll tell you more about that shortly. Our guest is Samuel Gregg, author of Reason, Faith, and the Struggle for Western Civilization. Sam, in the preface to this book, you write that your theme is not just the relationship between reason and faith, but what you call the, quote, pathologies of reason and faith, unquote. What do you mean? Well, I have to first confess that the phrase doesn't come from me. It comes from Joseph Radford, of course, Benedict XVI. And what I mean by that, and what I think he certainly means by that, is the notion that um, we shouldn't assume that reason and faith by themselves are always and necessarily going to be good things. In fact, when reason and faith become detached from each other, they can become very dangerous in themselves. So the most obvious example, I suppose, is um, radical Islam. Radical Islam has a distinctly low view of reason. It has a distinctly low view of the idea that you can integrate faith and reason in the way, for example, that Christianity has traditionally done. And when you take away reason from faith, faith becomes dangerous. It can become fundamentalist, for example. But on the other hand, it can also degenerate into sentimentalism as well. And it's the same with reason. If you take reason and you separate it from what I'm calling faith, which means an instance of the sort of belief in these greater realities for which we have some evidence but which we can't prove definitively, then reason can very easily generate into things like scientism, into rationalism, into justifying forms of utilitarianism, etc. And the thing that I try to articulate in the book is that the genius of the West has been its ability to integrate these two spheres of knowledge. And it's been a difficult process. Sometimes the balance isn't always right. But it is key to understanding who we are today and some of the problems that we face in the West today as well. So when you have reason and faith drifting away from each other, you see these pathologies starting to develop both in the world world of reason and in the world of faith. And in the West, if it is to remain the West, has to keep these two things together. So if we see in... Islamic civilization, certainly radical Islam, an example of faith without, faith without reason. Where exactly do we see these days reason without faith? Uh, I would say you see, for example, in the emergence of what's often called scientism. Scientism is the notion that empirical, empirical reason, the empirical sciences are the main and if not the only form of reason that there is. And empirical science, by its very nature, excludes religious questions, because religious questions are dismissed as being questions of emotion, questions of sentiment, questions of feelings, and empirical science doesn't deal with those things. And that leads to many people thinking that science, the natural sciences, are the only real way that we can comprehend reality. And I think that it's also important to note here, we have to ask ourselves, which faith are we talking about? Because when we think of faith, we often think of a leap of faith, people making this jump into something they don't quite know and they're not quite sure what's on the other side. But faith, at least as this has been understood in the West, involves a particular conception of God. And that conception of God is of God being a rational being. The Greek word is logos, that God himself is divine reason. Now, if that's your understanding of faith, then the the notion that faith and reason go together harmoniously and inform and shape one another, that works very well. But if your vision of, of, of reason is highly scientific, then you're going to have a great difficulty trying to talk about God in any other way that is a question than as a question of subjective preference. And that leads to to things like rationalism, to things like scientism. It also, I think, leads to ideologies as well. I think Marxism can be explained in much in in this way. I think utilitarianism can be explained in much of this way. Now, of course, I'm not saying 
that this relationship between faith and reason is the only thing that explains some of the intellectual problems and the political problems and the economic problems and the cultural problems that we experience today. But I am saying that if we don't deal with this problem and address it properly, it's not just that we will have difficulty understanding why we have members of a particular religion who are engaged in terrorism against Western countries. We also basically empty out the core of what the West is itself. So it's not just a question of dealing with threats from without, it's also a question of dealing with problems that exist within. You're listening to the Bookmonger production of National Review. Packing your toiletries always involves a delicate game of stacking and space hacking. That's why Quip electric toothbrushes work just as well at home as they do on the go. The compact and wireless design tucks easily into the corner of your carry-on or in your back pocket if you're just going overnight. Plus, the travel-ready cover protects your brush from sandy swimsuits and luggage slip-ups. And a three-month battery life will last through a season filled with weekends away. They're making it easier than ever to keep up with your wake-up and wind-down routine when you're out of the office. I like Quip a lot because it has a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides and help you clean your whole mouth evenly. Quip starts at just $25, and if you go to getquip.com slash book right now, you get your first refill pack for free. That's your first refill pack for free at getquip.com slash book. Sam, sometimes we we hear about enlightenment thinkers, uh, people who value reason. They say faith is a superstition, maybe. But they also might say, using their powers of reason, that faith is a kind of noble lie, that it's useful to society. It's just not true. Where does that fit into this uh, analysis? Well, one of the points that I try to make in the book is that The Enlightenment is a much more complicated phenomena than I think uh, we often talk about. I think we often see the Enlightenment, or Enlightenment, because it's more than just one, as this type of phenomena whereby this this emphasis upon science, upon reason, upon liberty, etc., etc., and religion is seen as obscurist, just superstitious, blocking progress, etc., And one of the things I do in the book is go back and say, well, if you look at the different enlightenments, what you discover is a much more complicated uh, phenomena and much less monolithic. It turns out that uh, many of the people who we regard as enlightenment thinkers turn out to be deeply religious men for the most part. In fact, the numbers who were, number of enlightenment thinkers who were explicitly viewing religion as pure superstition, or even going to the point of saying, well, there is no God. They're a tiny minority, and we see this particular type of enlightenment in the sense of people taking reason seriously, taking the scientific method and the empirical method very seriously, but also not giving up on God, because they understood God as being, as I mentioned before, the Logos. The classic example is someone like Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton, who is often regarded as the hero of the enlightenment, was deeply devout, Anglican. He took God very seriously. In fact, he rejected deistic accounts of the nature and origins of the universe. And I think that that story about the Enlightenment, and there's a, there's a, this is an Enlightenment that occurs in Protestant Europe, it also occurs, occurs, by the way, in Catholic Europe, it also occurs within the Jewish world in Europe at the time. What we see is that there's a, most of these Enlightenment thinkers take religion very seriously, They're not in the business of trying to demolish religion. Um, Most of them are people who are going to church every week. These are people who, um, for for example, in the Scottish Enlightenment, you find, for example, that most of the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers were clergymen of the Church of Scotland. So people like, say, David Hume uh, or Voltaire, when it comes to their skepticism about religion, they're very much peripheral figures. And one of the things I try to do in this book is to say that Christians, religious believers, shouldn't be afraid of the Enlightenment. There's many good things that happen in the Enlightenment. There's some bad things as well, but there's many good things about the Enlightenment, which I think in many respects is in, are incomprehensible without the background of Jewish and Christian faith and the seriousness with which those two faiths take reason. What about this mode of thinking, though, where where you have a secularist who's actually not hostile 
to religion and sees mm-hmm. faith as useful, just not true. Well, I mean, I talk about that towards the end of the book, and I say, look, there are many people who are, let's call them non-believers, who are not convinced, they're, they're genuinely, honestly not convinced that there is a God, they're not hostile to religion, they see it as useful, but they just don't accept it as true. One of the things I try to do in the book is to say, look, there are obviously many people like that. Uh, Michael Novak, uh, the theologian, used to call them smiling secularists. And I think that's a nice way of explaining it. And what I try to do in the book is to say, so even someone who's not a believer can look at Judaism and Christianity and say, look, these are the two religions that are core to the center of Western civilization. There is no Western civilization without Judaism and Christianity. That's not a religious statement. That's not a theological or philosophical statement. That's simply a statement of fact. And it's also true that these two religions have taken themes like creation, reason, uh, uh, freedom, very, very seriously, much more seriously, I have to say, than any other religion. And so if you're a non-believer and you're struggling and disagree flat out with the claims of Jewish or Christian faith, you can still say, yes, I don't believe this stuff, but I do accept that these have been the key incubators of some of the key themes, the key theses, as I call them, that made the West what it is. And so people like that can say, look, I I don't believe, but I think that these things are important as a cultural phenomena that have made the West what it is, and we will be worse off as a civilization without the active presence of believing Jews and Christians in this world. The author is Samuel Gregg. The book is Reason, Faith, and the Struggle for Western Civilization. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please take a minute to leave a review on iTunes. Your reviews help new listeners discover us, and it helps us keep this show going. We'll be back next week with a new episode of The Bookmonger.